want to do it again. Good morning. Okay. All right. Uh, hey, I know that I met Josh mentioned it. Like the summer Sundays sometimes can be like sporadic. You'll have this time every once in a while where you have like fewer people. I got to say, I have said this to y'all before. I do enjoy these times because of the intimacy that's involved. And I really do like it. And so I just want to share that so that y'all can feel the measure of investment that I feel even now as I'm talking to you. Like even though like we have a several, like a lot of people are going to be on vacation or doing X, Y, and Z at this moment. Don't go thinking about vacation right now that I said it. Focus. But... Uh, like even that it doesn't it doesn't make me as the shepherd here look and be like okay this is like a throwaway Sunday it actually makes me value this time together and like I know that there will be like someone that's not here that'll send me a text message this week be like oh like this convicted me about the sermon or something like that and I, I, I I'm glad that this will still get to the congregation and yet I just really like being in these spaces where when they come around and we have this intimate spot and I get to look at each one of you and be very intimate with you and make awkward amounts of eye contact with you, uh, I enjoy that. And so for all those watching and listening later on, not that I want to do it every week. So uh, so get home from vacation and then come back to church. But uh, I'm just excited about that. So real quick, before we jump into time of the word, one quick thing. Um, so over the course of the summer, we are needing more kids volunteers. I know that there's been several, yeah, yeah. Okay, woo for kids. I, we have a conviction about the idea of family. Here's the thing. Uh, even right now, one of the things we're working on is starting a family support ministry. The idea of taking this family unit in our community here, Southeast Austin. Almost half the households are single mom households, right? We got a bunch of needs present. And a part of what that is, is serving and building the community in a way that blesses not just mom and dad, not just grandma and grandpa, but bless son and daughter right, bless grandson and granddaughter. And as a result, one of the ways that we do that is through coordinating and putting together children's ministry so that we can share and encourage the kiddos here at our church. Over the course of this summer, now we've had a lot of transitions from the spring, but especially during the summer with so many of the ins and outs like this morning, right, uh, we have seen the need to try and say, hey, how can we get some more people volunteering for kids ministry? And so even if it's first during the duration of this summer and you're able to say, hey, for the summer, I'll be able to help out. That's a great start. If it's something that you want to commit to a little bit longer, that's great, too. Uh, maybe you preferred. But either way, we wanted to make sure we threw that out there, recognizing that a part of our vision in terms of who we are uh, is to support whole family units. And a way we do that is by providing children's ministry and, and providing a space for the kiddos to go learn and serve and grow. And so with that, I want to invite you to consider reaching out uh, to Lex specifically if you have a desire and say, hey, I wanna help out for this summer or hey, I'm interested in actually serving here long-term. I really want to uh, be involved in this, serve. I love kids or I feel like the Lord's calling. Maybe you're like, I know some people back there are like, I don't love kids, but I feel like the Lord is telling me I need to be back here to stretch and to grow in Christ. And it's like, all right, that's great. If that's you, I ain't gonna tell you no, you should do what the Lord's calling you to do. And so, yeah, with that, if you have uh, that nudge or, or, or inkling, uh, then I want to encourage you to reach out to Lex. Uh, I can send her, her email will be in the weekly email this week. And so you can reach out to her uh, and then, or if you do, do not have her information, you can reach out to me and I'll put you in connection with her. But wanted to put that out there. We'll be sending some emails about it this week. I wanted to make sure it's out there in front of you. That way you're thinking about it, recognizing kind of where we're going, where some of our needs are and how we can help uh, not just meet needs here on Sunday, but contribute to the ongoing vision of who we are as a church and who we hope to be. So with that said, uh, reach out to her. Again, if you have any questions, you wanna, wanna commit to that. What we're gonna do today for the, our time being, start a timer, yeah. four minutes in already, jeez. Um, <coughs> we're gonna work through our time in the word and we're working through uh, our 10 commandments series where we are really working through each of the 10 commandments and that's all we're doing, okay? And so we're working verse by verse for the most part trying to just work through uh, these commandments and see exactly what's happening. Now, here's the thing. The Ten Commandments are a wild little piece of um, Scripture. Not because they are so incredibly wild. They do what a lot of Scripture does, trying to give us a vision of who God is and using that in order to have a vision of who we are. But what's wild about them is how incredibly politicized they are in our culture. If I were to gauge you and just say, like, you know what the Ten Commandments are, there's like a 100% chance whether you're a Christian, non-Christian, or anything else, that you'd be like, I'm aware of what those are. 
And it may be because you've heard in the news someone had them on the Capitol or this Capitol or that Capitol or some other public space. And there was another group that was like, no, you shouldn't do that. And then another group was like, no, well, our country is built on this. And it was like this weird political argument. And so from there, right, we have this weird space where we engage on a, on a surface knowledge of the fact that these exist. And then we go, okay, well, they must exist so that they can tell us how to live. And so then we look at them and go, I'm gonna try to follow each one of these to the T in the most literal way possible. And yet, in the midst of that, we lose all of the, all the riches that are in them that show us who God is, what they were meant to do. Not just to look at us and go, here's how you should live, but rather, here's who God is. And from there, let that idea shape who we are as they teach us who God is. Today, the uh, commandment is the fifth commandment, and it is honor your father and your mother, right? This is a great one, right? Everybody likes this one. I, when you're a parent, you really like this one. I'm a big fan of this commandment. This is, I have three kiddos and uh, I absolutely love, I remember this time, uh, I have three kiddos and I absolutely love the idea of people honoring their father and their mother. But here's the thing, I would love to even just start this way. What has that historically meant for you? From your perspective, what has the idea of honor your father and your mother, what has that been taught to you to be and how do you live that out? Anybody, feel free to just give me an answer. I'm a class participation person. Say again. Obedience. That's a big one. Everybody knows that one. Be obedient. Yeah, anybody else? Respect. That's another one for sure. Obedience, respect. Let's do two more because I know y'all got some more. Don't talk back. Yeah, so be respectful. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Okay, respectful, obedient. Um, say, what was yours again? Respect. Okay. Yeah, sorry, you doubled down. Okay, sorry, I'm tracking now. Uh, anybody else? A, a last one, a fourth one. Gratitude. Okay, we got, ooh, four and five. Gratitude and what else? Taking care of them. All these are great. All these, I would say, to some extent are true. However, the thing is, a lot of these uh, are, are what we've been taught in environments like church. And the thing is, if you go and open the Bible to the commandment, take honor your father and your mother, what it says is honor your father and your mother. It actually doesn't say be respectful. It doesn't say obey. It doesn't say take care of them. It doesn't say uh, be grateful for them. It says honor them. And the thing is, a lot of even what we bring into this conversation right now, as we have in weeks prior, is actually what's been built through what people have told us we're supposed to do and what we're being told it means without necessarily even working through what it actually means. And what God is calling us to as we see the idea of honor your father and your mother. And here's the thing, once we start to put this commandment in context, I think what we start to derive is, is this, that God asks us to honor our parents for the sake of his kingdom and for the sake of our world. God asks us to honor our parents for the sake of his kingdom, for the sake of our world. Now you may be like, that seems very not what I've been taught. In addition, it seems like a major departure from a simple verse that says, honor your father and your mother. However, I really want to get into this because I think that this can be enlightening and I think it can be empowering. I think it can be a little convicting, but I, I do think it can be very impactful for us. So let's, let's jump in here. All right, so first let's start by reading it. It's going to be a real simple verse to read, guys. I'm talking real simple. It's Exodus 20, verse 12, and it says, honor, honor your father and your mother so that you may uh, have a long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Great. Honor your father and your mother so you can have a long life in the land that the Lord is giving you. Now, here's the thing. Jumping in here, I don't think this is rocket science to read it literally. Honor your father and your mother. That's not a hard thing. That's not a bad thing. But I think in order for us to start gaining a little perspective of what this means, we, of course, have to understand what honor means. Now, here's the thing. Uh, what does honor mean? Literally, honor means to be or make heavy. That's what this word means in the Bible. Honor here is to be or to make heavy. And the thing is, it could actually be used in a negative way. Like, man, something is so heavy that it's a burden to me. Or to lay a burden on someone or to be a burden to someone. If you were to say, use the same word would be used to say, I have made myself heavy to someone. And it could actually mean I've made myself a burden to somebody. Here's the thing. It also means to be so heavy that it's on, like you're, you're, an, you're an honorable person. You're placed in high regard. This word is actually the root word for the idea of God's glory in the Old Testament. That God is so heavy, that he's so big, that when he's placed into your life, 
his heaviness displaces everything else and he takes top priority. It's actually the same idea that he is so heavy, he is so weighty that it actually means that he displaces everything else and for him to be glorified in your life means that he takes top spot. And so what does that mean? That's actually really hard to navigate with this verse then because what it means, if we're not careful and if we kind of just start working through it, should I be like glorifying my parents the way I glorify God? Should the way God displaces everything in my life and should become the top priority in my life, should I not treat my parents that way where they have so much weight in my life that they now displace everything and whether they're right or whether they're wrong or anything else, they take the top spot. Their opinion matters the most and they are what shapes my life the most. And here's the thing, friend. I want to emphatically and, and patiently and, 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 and mercifully tell you that is not what this is saying. Like many portions of scripture, when we read them and we make the point of them us, or mom and dad, or son and daughter, if you're the parent looking at them, we tend to miss the mark and we misinterpret what God is actually wanting to show us in the Bible. And when we're the main point instead of God being the main point, we end up missing the mark and laying a lot of heavy weight on people to act a certain way, to behave a certain way, and put standards that the Bible does not have for people. Standards that the Bible does not have for you as a son, as a daughter. Expectations that, it, that as fathers and mothers we should not have. And then starts to put them on to other people and create these really difficult situations. I know a lot of you have experienced, and I've experienced them too, right? And we've all experienced them. Where there is this, this feeling that, hey, honor your father and your mother. And despite the ambiguity of that just basically being like, hey, make them heavy. There's actually this weird expectation of like, obey every single thing they say. Or like, hey, even if things are wrong, you should be honor being honorable and submit to them and honor them. And so that's not what's happening here. Not what's happening here. Actually, if we start to put, again, this idea into context, um, I think we start to pull out two very specific things. Uh, actually, before we go there, there's a great quote that I almost skipped over, but I want you, I want you to read it. I want you to join me in, in exploring it. When I was looking up this idea, the fact that this doesn't mean what we think it means, I uh, referenced a, a, a commentary by a man named Peter Enns, and he's a biblical scholar. Dude's a brilliant dude. Has written a lot about the books of Genesis, specifically Exodus, but the rest of the first five books of the Bible as well. And in his commentary, he said this regarding what honor means. What does honor of one's parents mean? Does it mean doing what they say no matter what? What if the parents are wrong? Is there ever a time when a child, when children outgrow this commandment? In light of the ambiguity of this and other commandments, it seems to me that we may be asking too much from them, them being the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are consistently ambiguous. It means it's hard to understand what they're saying. And I suggest that it is not just, that is not just the case uh, for us, but for the ancient Israelites themselves. They reveal to the Israelites a bit of who God is knowledge that must translate into appropriate behavior on their part. The Ten Commandments are not exhaustive pieces of legislation. This may not be up there, but just listen. Um, the Ten Commandments are not exhaustive pieces of legislation that account for each and every contingency and possibility. So, we're not supposed to understand every interaction we have with our parents or our children based on this one commandment. They're supposed to inform us on who God is and from there drive us to a certain type of action and behavior in response to who God is. But they're not telling us exactly how you interact with mom and dad. Then what are, what are they exactly saying then? Well, uh, I think placed in context, it speaks to two things. The first one is this, that God asks us to honor our parents to instill the truth of who God is through generations. That God asks us to honor our parents to instill who God is generations of people. In addition to that, the second idea is that he uh, wants to provide a vision of life in him to the world around us, okay? A vision of life in him to the world around us. Now, let's start working through that first idea. He wants to instill the truth of who God is. Uh, in his commentary on this text, a man named John Walton, and I've referenced him a lot during the series, he's a really sharp dude. Uh, he wrote and he pointed out something really powerful, that the culture and the world that this is written to, there's not like unbelievers present, right? There's not unbelievers present. It's only believers. It's only followers of Yahweh, the Hebrew God. And you gotta remember what these people just went through. They're not like, oh yeah, like we kind of have these cultural Christians and we can participate in cultural Christianity periodically where we go, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of God, but it hasn't have this weighty impact on our heart and our life. 
I just say, yeah, I'm a Christian because that's what I believe, that's what I do. Maybe I go to church periodically, maybe I don't, but I believe that. These were individuals that in the story that we're reading were slaves and are now free. And that happened all through the context of God intervening and showing himself to be powerful and real and present. And as a result, their response is to have a convicted, following, honoring, worshiping heart toward God. Do they make mistakes? Absolutely. Exodus is riddled with God's people making a ton of mistakes. But the conviction of their heart to the truth of who God is, is very real. And as a result, one of the consistent practices that these individuals have is to pass along the truth of who God is, the fact that he's compassionate, he is merciful, he is gracious, and what he's done, that he hears them, he sees them, he frees them. This is the, the, the realities of who God is that they're meant to pass down. And so we see this happen throughout this part of the Bible a lot, right? Let me turn this down. I feel like my own text messages are blowing up up here with you. Uh, so you think about something like Deuteronomy 6, this, this famous verse called the Shema, a prayer, where the scriptures say, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Uh, these words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart, and then repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, right? Um, let's stop there. And then from there, you, it's not just here. It's even earlier in the book of Exodus, right? Exodus 10 has a great moment here that kind of gives us the same vision. When, when God is about to start moving in Egypt, he says, then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may do these miraculous signs of mine among them. Uh, and so that you may tell your son and grandson how severely I dealt with the Egyptians and performed miraculous signs among them. And you will know that I am the Lord. And so culturally, what's happening here is that the Israelites have been instructed over and over again, that if you have children, if you're part of this community, if you have nieces, if you have nephews, if you have grandchildren, you're supposed to tell the tales, tell the stories of what I've done and who I am. Tell those stories over and over and over again. Help form and shape the vision of your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren with the idea that while you were in bondage and while you were in pain, the Lord God, he heard you. And he sees you, and he knows you, and he will free you. Hell of how when you failed, he responded with compassion. And he continues to restore, even after failure, after failure, after failure. This is the message that the parents within Israel, those who had influence over younger people, what they were supposed to do. And so here, truly, right, is the message that even before you were able to understand the words of the Bible and the story of the Bible. You were supposed to absorb the truth of who God is from your mom, from your dad, from your uncle, from your aunt, from your grandpa, from your grandma, from all those around you continue to speak the truth of who God is to you. Now this raises some actually some difficult questions, right? For parents, I think it raises really challenging questions, which is like, how are we actually doing that? In your life as a parent, how are you shaping the hearts of your children in order to see the truth of who God is. How are you doing that? And then a maybe scarier question is, how are you failing to do that? I gotta be honest with you, when I'm hard on my son, and I can be, y'all know him, he was right there, he was over swinging on this, he was going full Tarzan on that, on that thing right there, right? Like he can be really challenging at times. And he's gonna look back 10 years from now at these sermons, be like, was I really that bad? And everyone's like, yes, bro. You really, you were, you were a handful, like, oh, like not, and I feel that I can lose my patience with them sometimes. I've been working on it a lot, but I still feel like I can. In those moments, I have to step back and go, man, how am I reflecting who God is? How am I communicating and sharing, displaying who God is to this boy? Are you going to see God as some angry, frustrated person that with every slip up, with every mistake, responds with anger and vengeance? Or is he going to see God as a patient, compassionate, loving father who with every stumble reacts with patience and compassion, picks him up, he used to push him down the field to say, let's keep going. Let's keep going. My man, let's get up. Let's dust ourselves off. Let's, let's, let's go. That's on me. That's terrifying. At the same time, with my words, how am I teaching? 
my kids? How am I sharing with my kids who God is for parents? Those are actually really challenging, challenging questions. But there's also for kids. Let me be honest. I'm going to ask you a very serious, one of the serious questions that comes to this is how much of, of our vision of God has been completely tainted because of how our parents have been. And the thing is, you may be holding a grudge toward God. You may be holding a grudge toward who you be, think he is and who you believe he is because that's how your parents were. Because that's how your father was, how your mother was. And now you cling to that, you're embittered by that, you're angry at him when the reality is the person you're angry at is not him at all, is your mom and your dad. Well, how much of the baby is getting thrown out with the bathwater when we're allowing our parents to shape our minds and, and shape our hearts toward who God is? That's a very real thing. And, and we as children, as the kids of our parents, the grandchildren of our grandparents, we're not doing the work of navigating hey, what here should I separate and what here should I keep. And then the reality is for all of us, for all of us, how are we actively trying to instill this truth to the world around us at large? I'm going to be honest. Like, like being for real, you may not have kids, right? You may not talk to your adult children that much. There's some, they're not here today, but on the, like later on for podcasts, you may have adult children. There's a few people here that have adult children. You may not talk to them every day. But you know what the thing is? That doesn't mean that there's not people all around you desperately need the truth of who God is, that don't desperately need the truth that he sees them, he hears them, and he will free them, that doesn't desperately need to know that when he sees failure, he responds compassionately, mercifully, lovingly. There are people all around you and all around me that desperately need to hear that. And the truth is, when we hear the words, honor your mother and your father, the idea isn't just, all right, I'll be respectful and obedient, and that's my job. The idea is there is a heritage of who God is that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And that has moved the story of God so that the people that were reading this story and were writing this story thousands of years ago, today in a small school in Southeast Austin in 2000, the year of our Lord, 2023, right? That we still have these stories now. That's the heritage that comes from this one verse that we've passed it down over and over and over again. How are you continuing that heritage? Like, and maybe you don't have kids. Maybe, maybe, but there are people around you that need to hear that truth. Maybe you do have kids and they're older. I'm 33 years old. 33 years old. My dad is right there. There are elements, and I'm grateful for this, there are elements of my adult life as a man that he looks at and goes, to be fair, I think you kind of already got your wings and you're going. And there's some spaces where he comes in and goes, hey, you know what? Maybe you can work on this. He still parents me, but he parents me in a different way because I'm a grown man with three children and, and we, we, we relate to each other as men oftentimes, even more than we relate to each other as father and son. And yet the reality of his spiritual stewardship over my life has not stopped because while there may be a certain graduation point where I've gone from child to man, there is no graduation point where I've gone from needing grace to not needing grace. There's no space where I've gotten where I become a super Christian, where I've graduated Christianity. There's no graduates. Uh, what is it Paul Tripp, I want to say, says, there's no grace graduates. That idea is so true. Paul Tripp's a pastor. Go check him out if you want to. He actually has grace, so you can go check him out for real. But what I'm getting at is that there's no, there's no one who has graduated that space of grace. And so even the parents in the room, if you have adult children, the need to continue to shepherd them and point them toward the truth of who Jesus is, is something that you need and I need, no matter how old we are, no matter where we are in life, no matter how good of a job we have, no matter how good of a house we have, no matter how great things look, there is still a corruptible part inside of us that needs people around us, parents, brothers, sisters, even our own children, to look at us and go, hey, I need to point you to the one, I need to point you to the master. You need that. I need you to have it. So that, that's what this looks like, right? We, we're all here, but we've received a heritage of, of God instilling the truth of who he is through generations and generations and generations. And now the fifth commandment to honor your father and your mother is a part of you participating in the truth of, in, uh, of in, the, in the practice of instilling that truth further down the line. And here's the thing, you may be looking at yourself right now, 
and may kind of feel that sense of like, but I don't feel equipped to do that, right? I don't feel like I'm, I don't know enough. I don't feel smart enough in the Bible at bare minimum or like in Jesus is, whatever the case is. And maybe you kind of feel that sort of inadequacy. Uh, two things to that. One, we don't, as a church, want you to feel that. And so it is part of our calling to try and equip you with what you need in order to feel more equipped. That's a part of, like, our vision for our children's ministry. Uh, that's a part of my vision for, like, classes and things that we, we do uh, during the summer. But listen to me. What I'm getting at here is that that's a part of the thing. We want to equip you, do the most that we can. However, you also don't need as much as you think. I'll be honest, I am nerdy. I really, really love the Bible. Those of you that were there on Wednesday, you got a glimpse of the things that make it to the cutting room floor when I'm just sitting there going, oh, in the Hebrew, there's not this, and there's italicized words in your English Bible, but that actually means that they're not there. And I just nerd out, and there was like, I want to say, I want to say Megan Connie was the only one that was looking at me like, nice. Everyone else kind of looking at me like, oh, this dude's going way deep. Okay, I don't know. I'm wading through waters that feel a little bit overwhelming to me. I love the Bible, and I love theology, and that shows in how I talk and how I teach my children. And yet last night, as I was resting and feeling convicted by the words and the ideas here in this sermon, I looked at my children, and I didn't try to bring anything so profound or so in-depth. I just woke, I, I was putting them to bed. I stopped, and I said, Leah, Jude, they share a room. They both got up, and they said, hey, I looked at them, and I just went, I want you to know more than anything else I've said to you in your entire life that Jesus loves you no matter what. He loves you. He always will love you. There will never be a moment in your life that he does not love you. There will never be a failure. It's too much for him to stop loving you. Jesus loves you no matter what. And Leah, she's like, okay, yeah, Jesus loves you. She like repeats everything back to me. She's like, really? She's going to be a great student, this one. But I knew that it had landed when my son Jude, he put his head on the pillow and to himself, he just said, Jesus loves me no matter what. And he closed his eyes and he tried to go to sleep. There was nothing beyond theologically what you can do in that moment. The simple power of looking at those around you, not just children, but maybe your coworkers, or someone else, simply being able to say, Jesus loves you, dude. He loves you. I don't have answers to every question. And the questions that I have questions about, I'm going to call Josh, and Josh ain't going to have the answers to every question. But what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt is Jesus loves you. It's enough, friend. That's enough. Are we doing that well, effectively? How are we showing, communicating that? And so, honor thy father and thy mother. It's an invitation to ask the truth of who God is through generations. Now, here's the other thing. It's also to provide a vision of life in him to the world. So to provide a vision of life in God to the world around us. Now, uh, honoring your father and your mother. I got a little emotional. I'm trying to gather myself. Uh, honoring your parents provides a vision uh, for life in God. And this is done in at least one way. Uh, here's the thing. It, the, the way it does that to the world around you is that it puts you in a structure where there's something above you. It forces you to live in authority to something else. You are submitted to an authority that's above you some way. And let me tell you, right now, automatically, for some of us, this may fight against the cultural narrative that you believe about your life. That somehow in your life, what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to have all the authority over your own life. And from there, you use that authority to make all the choices and you, have, you get to make all the decisions about what you think is right and about what you think is wrong. And let me be very honest, that has generally, through the course of human history, caused a lot of issues. I'm putting that politely. It caused a lot of damaging, hurtful instances. And yet when we are called to honor our father and our mother, we're called to treat them with compassion and love and respect, all the things that we talked about earlier. And what it does, it puts us in a context where we're in a, a tiered system of authority. There's someone over us that we do not treat poorly, we don't yell at, we don't disrespect, we consider what they say, and we take what's good and we apply it to our lives. And then the things that are bad, that may not be appropriate, that may, if we're not careful, shape our hearts in 
in bad ways, right? We let that go. But we find ourselves in a structured system of authority that helps us show this is what life in God is. It's us not just submitting to one another, but more than that, it's us together looking at God and saying, you can tell me how to live my life. You inform my heart, you inform my mind. That practice of being under authority happens not to God first, it actually happens to our parents first. That's where it starts. The ability to look at them and say, hey, I honor you, I respect you, I'm listening to you, I'm being shaped by you. And then we learn how to do that with God from there. But that's the vision. The thing is, this is where I mentioned earlier, it, it, may, not, it may not be around. It, you may not have perfect parents. And when I say that, what I mean is that this idea is more difficult now than it was then. Because your parents, they may not have been followers of you. They may have had corrupt visions of who God is and what Christianity is. And so your experience with this idea doesn't, may not have provided you with uh, an actual vision for what life in God looks like. It may, have, it may have given you a vision of a broken and hurting and really anger-filled world. I know that's the case. I know that all of us have had instances like that because none of your parents were Jesus. They were all normal people who may have subscribed to the teachings of Jesus, but even then may have received those and they may have gotten so jumbled around in their own lives that they came out the other side applied to you in horrific ways. And here's the thing. What I'm not saying here is a vision of life in God is the vision of you humbly going, okay, anything you say, but rather that you would respond to your parents in godliness. That submitting to God would be seen through how you submit to parents. And what that looks like is that when they offer you something godly, maybe you humbly take it. But when they act godlessness, when they act ungodly, you respond to it the way God would, which is in compassion and mercy, justice. Again, we use justice a lot, but justice not as in revenge, but justice in restorative justice. Can I make this right? Do I need to maybe even respond to my parents and say, hey, I don't think that's right. I, I, and I, I'm concerned here, not just with trying to argue with you, but just for the sake of your soul and for the sake of your heart, I love you and I see the lack of godliness that's going on in your character. I see the lack of godliness that's going on in your mind and your heart. And what I want is for that to be restored and made right. And so here is my honest feedback about the thing you just said, the thing you just did. That's how God would respond to that. We see that through the Bible a lot. Now, he, that's your call in honor your father and your mother. Respond to godliness with honor, with admiration, praise, and with acceptance, and respond to the lack of godliness with a lot of mercy. But seeking justice, but, but that means seeking restoration and, and a lot of mercy. Your parents need a lot of mercy. My kids are going to look at me one day, and I hope that they realize I need a lot of mercy. At the mercies of God that were offered me every day, I exhausted them every day. I just used them because I was an imperfect man. I made a lot of mistakes. And one day, if they have children, they will be in that same position. They will be in need of a tremendous amount of mercy. So that's what we're doing. We're providing a vision of God's life, of life in God to the world around us, not just right by being honorable, but by, by showing God's character to the world in the, in the form of our family in our mothers and our fathers and our children and our, and our grandchildren. Those are the two ways I think that, that this goes down. We are instilling the truth of who God is through generations and providing a vision of what life looks like in God. But the thing is, I know that a lot of us may still, still feel very detached from this idea. Because maybe you look and think like, I... I don't necessarily feel like I have a parent that's worthy of any type of honor. Maybe you have some real issues and real, um, real odds with your parents, and so maybe that's a struggle for you. Maybe as a result, you feel not quite so honorable yourself. Maybe you feel a little bit fringe or unworthy bringing this idea of saying, I'm going to honor somebody because you may not necessarily even know what that feels like. Maybe you feel like you've never really been honored that well. Maybe you don't feel like you've been respected or honored by your parents. So you still feel very disconnected to this idea. And I'm talking, but you're not really, it's not landing with you because you feel like you don't relate or can't understand. Friend, let me tell you how and why you're connected. And if you think I'm going to give you Jesus, I'm going to give you Jesus. 
Because when I read this, I was overwhelmed. When I was working through this idea, I was overwhelmed by the truth of how Jesus perfectly lived. Like he instills the truth of, of who God is in everyone that he meets. Like he shows it overwhelmingly. He greets people who are hurting with compassion and love and care. And those who are clearly utilizing power to hurt others, he, he chastises and he corrects and he offers and he tries to create justice in the world around him. He foretells and tells of who God is and he shows who God is. To the world he is truly the reason that the disciples all came after he died and resurrected to be like we gotta go tell everybody why because jesus because you want to get famous no most of them weren't famous because you want to get rich most of them stayed poor because you want to live forever they did live forever but they died before that and most of them died gruesome deaths so clearly when any of them things what motivated them was like man do you remember him he spent time with him he clearly instilled the truth of who god is through generations but he also displayed life in God. He showed mercy and love. He showed what it looked like to literally be submitted to an earthly father who wasn't his biological father, and yet he observes his needs, his desires. He respected him. He loves him. He shows that same respect to his mother. He's dying on the cross, and he looks at his mother in front of him and says, hey, John's going to take care of you from now on. John, that's your mom. Mom, John's your son now. Y'all be a family together. He's caring for his parents in ways that go I mean, like, like literally he's dying and he's taking care of them. I mean, he shows all of this so incredibly well. And yet he goes to the cross as a dishonorable person. So the dishonorable people, you and me, those who have failed to show honor and those who have sometimes failed to be honored could now be received by God as honored. I want you to know, and I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, look at me. You are honored by God. God holds you in high esteem. He loves you, he sees you, he hears you, he's freed you, he knows you, he's, God honors you. The Bible's Bible, I mean multiple Bibles, they all say this, talks about the fact that you are his treasured possession. That you're his treasured possession, but through the work of Jesus, you are now so honored. You are God's treasured possession. That's what the work of Jesus has done, friend. That you who have failed to show honor and that you who have failed to be honored through the work of Jesus on the cross and in his resurrection, you are now honored by God. Friend, that washes over you in a way. I hope that's healing. I hope that if you've had any moments where you have felt inadequate, that you have felt small, not because of your own limitations, but because of the, of the curses that others have levied against you, that the truth that God honors you through the work of Jesus can refresh you, can rebuild you, can fight against those lies and leave you hopeful and empowered through the work of Jesus. That's what he did it for. And now, because of that, through his resurrection and the empowerment of his spirit, you are now called to receive that honor, to know what it is to be honored by him, loved by him, built up by him, and you're sent out to instill the truth of who he is and what he's done to others, to honor others and show the same honor that you've been shown in order to show a vision of the life that God has for us to the world around us and invite them in to knowing that very same God. That's the invitation today. But it starts with understanding what Jesus has done for you to be honored. It starts with that. It starts with you experiencing and accepting and wrestling with that honor, even when it fights against your moments of shame, even when it fights against your moments of bitterness, even when it fights against your moments of anger, even when it fights against your moments of sadness, even when it fights against your moments of, of feeling inadequate. When we wrestle with that and go, no, this is, I know what the truth is. I'm honored. I'm received by God. That's a starting point in order to go out and do any of the things we're talking about today. It effectively starts there with that wrestling match. And so with that, a few application points to end the day out, okay? Uh, I got to look at them because I kind of, oh yeah, that's right. Um, first one is invite someone to church, Bible study, invite someone into a moment of prayer. Do something that engages the spiritual reality of the world around you. Friend, that's not a, that's not a regular thing. I, right now, if I was like, hey, who here invited someone to church, Bible study, even asked someone to, did you, if you could pray for them today? I'm not going to do it. Don't raise your hand. Uh, I'm not trying to levy that. I'm not trying to levy that shame on you. Um, I think very few of us would raise our hand. I wouldn't raise my hand this week. I wouldn't. And so that's not, oh man, it's gone. Um, that's not a, a muscle that is natural 
That's a muscle that has to be worked. It has to be worked. It has to be built. And so when you don't ever do it, you're never going to do it. Just like if I never run a mile, I'm never going to run a mile. I have to start by getting out, walking, and running half and half, well, two thirds and a third, right? And then from there, I build the endurance through the muscles of my cardiovascular system, my legs, my core, in order to start building the endurance to go, I can do this. I can do this with, with, with consistency, getting easier. That's the same thing when it comes to our spiritual life and instilling the kingdom into other people. That's the same thing. It will not happen if you're not already doing it. It won't magically happen if you, I've heard people say, hey, I wanna be a missionary and I really wanna go to like Africa or India or you name it, right? And I'm oftentimes like, bro, do you make a disciple here? And they're like, no, man, but when I get there, it's like, that's not gonna happen. I'm just letting you know there's 0% chance it's gonna happen. You're not gonna start asking people to come to Jesus there if you've never done it here. And so, yeah, we wanna invite people into, and let me be honest, second, second part of this year, like, like someone that you know, maybe at your work, at your job, work, the same thing, in your community, whatever the case is, right? One of them maybe empowered the specific gifts that we need in order to be who we are. You have a vision of seeing this community impacted through family ministry, through, I mean, a resource center. And the thing is, some of the gifts and passions of people that you know that they don't even understand are going on inside of them may be awakened as they come here and get plugged into something. And the impact of the people all in this community may actually rest on someone that you know finding their passion in serving and following God here. And the one thing that, 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 that the link between those two realities is you going, you wanna come to church with me? That little, right? And so invite someone to church, practice, put that into practice. The second thing, um, the second thing is this, and this is much deeper, and so I saved it for a second, but reconciliation where possible. Uh, I think what's challenging here is that what I gave you was in essence the vision of what this verse meant applied to our lives in a pretty good, pretty good environment, pretty good context. The reality is I know that a lot of us don't live in that context. A lot of us have very serious relational issues with our parents, very serious divides. Um, some of us haven't talked to some of them. Um, some of us don't want to talk to some of them. Those are very big realities of the world we live in. Again, the world that this was written to and the world that we live in, very different places. And yet, yet, I think that as we start to understand that the honor that we long for, the love that we long for, the respect that we long for to come from them, actually just an echo and an arrow that says the heart of the human is actually only found when you're receiving the love and honor and care that you long for from the person that made you. Not your parents, but your God, right? When we start to be informed by that and we sh we're shaped by that, I do think God invites us to think about what it looks like to seek reconciliation relationally, even with parents, even with parents that we are angry at. In order to find it in our hearts, to start working toward a response that's filled, again, like we said earlier, with mercy and justice and compassion. It's not to say that everything gets swept under the rug. Again, I think justice is a word that we be comfortable with. Justice is the idea of trying to make things right and bring wholeness to a situation. But while that may seem like such a far thought for so many of us, when we're working by ourselves and we feel a lack of honor, we feel like we're unable to honor others, of course that feels light years away. But as we wrestle with the truth of what God has done for us in the person of Jesus, you were honored, loved, and seen here today, right? As we work through that, I think we're invited to try and work toward that, that destination that seems so far. Right, again, it may seem impossible, and yet I think that we're called to wrestle with it and try and get there. And the closer we get, even if we don't ever actually arrive, the closer we get, right, the more we understand who God is. The closer we get, the more we understand how God approaches us. So we keep working toward that space. And so see, relational reconciliation, where you can, where it's possible, understand that there's some situations where it's not possible, where things have been dangerous and where things have been hurtful on different levels. And when that happens, that's understandable. But if you find it possible to seek reconciliation with a parent, with a family member, uh, do it. With that, um, let's pray. Let's head into uh, communion and, and then the rest of the service. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, God, that we 
are given the opportunity in such a simple verse like honor your father and your mother, that again, from my perspective, before even just this week's studying seemed to mean something so much different than what I see it as now. The fact that you, through such simple words, honor your father and your mother, such simple ideas actually invite us to see your kingdom grow, to see lives change, to see um, people who are broken be restored, to see people who are hurting find healing, and ultimately to find hope that even those things that are left over in the remnants of our brokenness and the hurt of our sin could find hope in the fact that there is an eternal hope in you, our King and our God. Thank you, Father, that that's true. Thank you, God, that I'm invited and we are collectively invited to show people what it looks like to know you, not just to be this perfect family. That's not what we're shooting for, but to see people that have found security, that have found hope, that have found a sen certain sense of self, that have found confidence to be able to work through things relationally together, to be able to, to, to work through things in, in addressing what's wrong, but in not in efforts to just guilt and shame people, but to build up to where we're all made whole through our relational uh, interactions with each other, that we're able to do that through first finding our wholeness in you. And as we understand how we're honored and loved, then we're sent to honor and to build the relationships we have with others. So Father, thank you that, that this simple idea it, it actually gives us so much of a vision for who we are and what we're called to because of who you are and what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for the work of your son and how he, the most honoring, went to the cross as dishonorable so that we could be received in honor today. Let us worship you. Let us thank you. Let us respond to you, the deep affection and worship today. We love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.